Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this video on Guide to Legal History and Historians, where we will be covering all of the chapters of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins. This happens to be the last episode of this series, and in fact, there only we only will be covering one chapter because there are an odd number of chapters in the textbook, therefore this one will be covering only one chapter. However, fortunately there are two authors for this chapter, so we can still have a comparison at the end and two respective biographies of the two authors. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy and we will begin with the um, Chapter on Historians, Amicus Briefs, Practice and Prospect by Sam Ehrman and Nathan Pearl Rosenthal. So to start with a biography of each of the two authors, so starting with Sam Ehrman, he is a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School. He's a scholar of law and history and his teaching focuses on citizenship, the constitution, empire, race and legal change. He's the author of Almost Citizens, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Constitution and Empire, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2018. He's the, which, and he won the William Nelson Cromwell Foundation Book Prize for Best Book in the Field of American Legal History by an Early Career Scholar. He also has diverse articles, including The Safeguard or Barrier, an Empirical Examination of Bar Exam Cut Scores, published by in the J Legal Education in 2022, with Frisbee M and Quintanilla, Quintanilla VD, as well another article, Status, Manipulation, and Spectral Sovereigns, published in the 53rd Column of Human Rights Legal Review, 813, in 2022. He received his bachelor's at Harvard in English in the year 2000, and his Juris Doctor from the University of Michigan Law School, summa cum laude, and he was first in his class in 2007. He also later received a PhD from the University of Michigan in American Culture in 2010, and he was also the editor-in-chief of the Michigan Law Review in his time at the University of Michigan Law School, and during his PhD studies perhaps as well. He has served in fellowships at Harvard Law School and the Smithsonian Institute. He also the, uh, was an assistant professor at the University of Southern California, USC Gould School of Law before he was a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. He did clerkships for Merrick B. Garland at the U.S. Court of Appeals in the D.C., that's District of Columbia, or Washington, Circuit in 2009 to 2010, near the end of his Ph.D. studies. and for. Uh, and for four of the nine current U.S. Supreme Court justices previously were judges at the U.S. Um, the Washington D.C. Circuit, so it's actually a, quite a quite an influential court, at least in terms of progression of judges, including Chief Justice John Roberts also was a judge previously at this district court. He also clerked for Judge John Paul Stevens, who is now retired, and Anthony M. Kennedy for the U.S. Supreme Court in 2010 to 2011. So lots of clerkship experience as well. In terms of our biography for Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, he is the Associate Professor of History, Spatial Sciences, and Law at the University of Southern California Dornside College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. He's a historian of the 18th and 19th century Atlantic world, and he focuses on political and cultural history of Europe and Americas in the Age of Revolution, with a particular attention to transnational influences that shaped modern national politics. He received his PhD in history from Columbia University in 2011, with a dissertation on epistola epistolarity and revolutionary organizing, and published his first book on a different topic in 2015 titled Citizens Sold Sailors Becoming American in the Age of Revolution, published by Belknap and Harvard University Press. And it won the Society for French Historical Studies Gilbert Chenard Prize for a Distinguished Scholarly Book published in North America in History of Themes Shared by France and North, Central, or South America. 
and as well he both his PhD, he graduated from Harvard with a Bachelor of Arts, or an AB as they call it in Harvard, in 2004. His second book project was The Age of Revolution, a cultural history circa 1760 to 17, pardon me, 1760 to 1820, and his other essays and reviews appeared in a number of journals including the William and Mary Quarterly, the American Historical Review, and the Journal of the Early Republic. So, in terms of their chapter they wrote for the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, it's in part five, the last section of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, titled Doing Things with Legal History, and it is chapter 57, the last chapter of the textbook, Historians, Amicus Briefs, Practice and Prospect, by Sam Ehrman and Nathan Pearl Rosenthal. So, without further ado, we'll start with the introduction of this chapter. So the authors note that they began their collaboration as friends of the court, which is um, kind of what we call Latin amici, in 2014, where they organized colleagues to address the federal court contemplating whether natives of American Samoa who were born owing full allegiance to the United States are ipso facto U.S. citizens. Their historical brief in support of the Samoan plaintiffs argued that the United States in the 19th century had a strong presumption in favor of jus soli, that's Latin for justice alone citizenship, rooted in English precedent of Calvin's case, which heard in 1608, where a U.S. citizen was any person who was born on lands over which national sovereignty extended and who owed allegiance to the nation. The only means the U.S. Supreme Court found to limit this rule, they argued, was by recourse to explicitly racist arguments. This was the court's approach in the notorious Dred Scott decision in 1857 and the insular cases of 1901 to 1925, an approach that is no longer acceptable to today's jurists, according to the authors. The experience of writing the brief together was simultaneously thrilling and unsettling, according to the authors. They found themselves engaged in a kind of work quite different from the usual fare. They were accustomed to writing for fellow scholars with no ulterior agenda. As authors of an amicus brief, they found themselves trying to make an argument that could have immediate consequences for the citizenship status of thousands of Americans. Their readership of judges was tiny, known in advance, and focused on a very specific set of questions. The authors worked hard and to translate their scholarship into language that they thought would be appreciated in this very specialized audience, and historians' tendency to work alone gave way in this project to a cross-disciplinary collaboration that included working lawyers. So they sort of had to, in some ways, adapt their brief on both to um, fit with the desires of the judges and the lawyers in the courtroom. So perhaps a little bit unsettling, despite being also thrilling, they note. As authors, they talked to colleagues about the process of amicus briefing. They started to see that they shared both excitement and ambivalence about the project. Again and again, colleagues would express their enthusiasm for work being undertaken, then immediately add, I didn't think historians did that sort of thing. So it kind of goes under the radar, too. Authors found themselves in conversations about the ethics and strategy of the project, how legal and historical institutions interacted and did not, and what distinguished the ways that jurists and historians conceived of the past and used it. This chapter, therefore, which they have written in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, seeks to use the historian's toolkit to understand why historians often find amicus brief writing so vexed and how historians have navigated the challenges that it poses. To begin with, conceptual analysis of the historian's amicus brief in two parts focused on the problem of expertise, where the courts permitted historians to participate as friends of the court because they believed that scholars' knowledge of the past and its relationship to the present are valuable to their judicial work. So that's sort of the justification for permitting amicus briefs. Yet there are two troublesome questions, according to the author, about authors about expertise that threaten this cross-disciplinary collaboration. One is the nature of historians' expertise, about which things exactly are historians' expert, particularly relative to lawyers. The second is that courts work and expertise also concern relating to the past and present, especially where precedent is concerned. So where does the expertise of the historian end and the court begin? So are judges not necessarily historians? I think most people would 
agree, but why, perhaps? And why are, for example, historians not necessarily legists? This chapter, then, will uh, turn to a history of the high-profile amicus briefs by historians in the post-Second World period. Although Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954 was an early and influential instance of historians' participation in Supreme Court deliberations, the modern debate over the historians' amicus brief dates to the late 1980s, and the pace of such brief writing only really accelerated in the 21st century, so it's a pretty recent phenomenon, perhaps. And during those three decades, brief writers became more adapted adept pardon me, at choosing disputes and framing arguments that provide courts with historical narratives that are both relevant to them and conform to the norms of historical scholarship. Then, the, there will be a, in conclu conclusion, that um, the chapter will briefly consider what these analyses can tell us about the prospects for the future of amicus briefs, because historians' amicus briefs are encounters between the judiciary and academic history, the trajectory, ethics, and practice of each discipline shape the interaction, as we shall see. Lawyers and historians have distinct codes of scholarly ethics, and the historian friend of the court, or amici, must grapple with both. Since both legal and historical scholarship are dynamic, the interface is a moving target, according to the authors, and the authors nonetheless identify a few concrete strategies that have, a consist have been consistently useful for friends of the court, such as them, as they aim to bring historical scholarships to into the judicial process. To keep the topic manageable, the authors um, several note several limitations are required. Though the chapter is concerned with the place of history in jurisprudence, this is not about originalism. Historians and originalists both engage the past, but they do so in different ways, supposedly, according to the authors, that have been exhaustively catalogued elsewhere. Here it is sufficient to say that originalist work rarely counts as good academic history and vice versa. The chapter also is not about historians' expert testimony. Such testimony is subject to cross-examination and other forms of testing at trial which alleviates some concerns about amicus briefs and raises other concerns all on its own. Finally, the focus of, in this chapter in, is on amicus briefs filed with the Supreme Court. These have been the most influential among both lawyers and judges, so they offer a useful point of entry into the subject. But as we've seen with many of the chapters, there's often a bias towards Supreme Court hearings, but nonetheless, it's a good place to start, according to the authors, and I would agree as well. So, moving to section 2, following the introduction titled, The Historian Amicus Briefs, pardon me, The Historian Amicus, A Brief Conceptual Analysis. So, the institution of amicus curae, which means friend of the court, amicus is friends, and curae is court, um, is at once an admission of humility by the court and a gauntlet thrown down by it, according to the authors. A statement of humility by the court as it represents the judges' acknowledgement that their knowledge of a case, whether of relevant doctrines or the factual context, may be imperfect. By accepting the contributions of Amici, they declare themselves willing to accept the help of outsiders in order to find the right answer to a legal problem. So somewhat a humble act. It is also a gauntlet, according to the authors, that they throw down as the amici are challenged to prove to the court that they have knowledge or authority that the court ought to respect. So it is, in some ways, a challenge or a call to action. What distinguishes the scholarly amicus curiae from a mere citizen petitioning to the court is the claim, often made explicit, that the amicus po possesses some expert knowledge not otherwise available to the court. So they are not just some petitioner, they are um, vetted by the court. The juxtaposition of these two faces of amicus curiae is what makes amicus curiae briefs in general and the historian's amicus brief in particular difficult to carry off. Amici must thread fine conceptual and psychological needles in order to participate successfully in a court's proceedings. They have to be authoritative and provide expertise that the court recognizes in order to vault over the barrier that divides the ordinary non-party from the amicus curiae. Yet they must do so without overstepping the sphere in which the court welcomes their input and without offending the court's sense of its own authority, according to the authors. The problem of competition with the jurists' expertise is hardly unique to historians or other humanist amici. 
Amici in every field, no matter what kind of expertise they claim to supply, face the same problem. One might imagine that humanists, whose knowledge is less obviously technical than that which is supplied by social or natural scientists, would have a harder time presenting themselves as additive to the court's own expertise. So it's a little bit more challenging, perhaps, to prove that one is um, an expert, perhaps. Yet the courts, over time, acquire technical expertise in any area in which they frequently call to practice, forcing experts in even the most technical fields to take care not to overplay their authority. So, for example, a, a judge might have been practicing a certain area of law for many years, and despite not being a historian, over time would accumulate a lot of historical knowledge that the incoming historian amicus must prove to be um, additive above and beyond that which the judge knows. It's true nonetheless that history as a discipline faces some special hurdles in establishing its authority according to the authors over the intellectual domain distinct from that of the courts. The exact nature of historical methodology is fluid, one might even say unclear, even to many practicing historians. Kinds of expertise that are not able to offer the court can thus be difficult to pinpoint with precision. The paucity, or the shortage, of quantitative methods in today's historical scholarship, moreover, puts historians at something of a disadvantage. Our culture's trust in numbers confers value on arguments framed in terms of quantitative evidence, which is sort of generally not the same as historical evidence, and because interpreting the past is a central role of the common law judge, especially when they analyze precedent, judges may be particularly resistant to historian amicus who claim to be able to present a or the authoritative narrative of law's history. So in the common law system, laws are based on precedent, so in some ways the judges are in fact historians themselves, so really we have to pinpoint what is the main distinction between a historian amicus versus a judge who, who's been uh, in some ways a historian of law by studying common law precedent. So moving to section three in this exploration titled the brief of briefers or what do historians know anyway with a question mark. So what expertise can historians offer the court the authors ask there are at least three analytically distinct problems lurking within this question. The first is how historians demonstrate to the court that they have expertise, that they have a legitimate role as amici. Second question is about what kinds of expertise historians can supply to the courts. What is the nature of historians' expertise as it is relevant to the law? Third, what are the limits of the expertise that historians can offer the court? Other terms, which elements or aspects of the expertise offered will the court regard as adding to their knowledge rather than overlapping with their own rightful sphere of knowledge? On its face, it would seem that historians have not had much difficulty gaining access to the courts of Amici. Their status as experts seems to be a matter of mutual agreement. Yet the historian and the courts mean different things when they talk about expertise. When a historian talks about their expertise, it is usually in reference to a well-delimited area of geographic and temporal specialization. A level of scholar's expertise within this field depends on the quantity, quality pardon me, of the scholarship, linguistic and archival accomplishments, and the scholar's influence in setting the agenda in their field. Courts are far less attuned to these measures of expertise, and judges have limited capacity either to examine the prior scholarship of amicus briefers to assess whether their work is good or to test the expertise evident in the amicus briefs themselves by checking footnotes or evaluating arguments. So it's kind of a um, almost a paradox if the, if the judge has to go through and read all of the historian's content to vet them. Essentially, they're getting the same... or to some extent the same information anyway, so then there's, it detracts from the value. And then if they have to go through all the footnotes and such and evaluate the historian's arguments, then what value is the historian bringing in the first place? And judges rely on the disciplines themselves to do the vetting, so that, therefore it's therefore not necessarily the place of the judge to vet the historians. The historian field must vet their historians. If a field has shown itself to be authorized 
to be an authorized area of expertise. It's certified practitioners, in this case usually holders of PhDs in history, tend to be considered by the courts to be experts. So that's one way of determining if they have a PhD that's considered to be an expert. But if they don't have a PhD, well then perhaps they, they might have to prove it otherwise. These different understandings of expertise are consequential. They can be set they can set up broader Mr. Stunning's understandings between the courts and the Ami uh, amicus briefers about what about who has what expertise and in what sh which domains it might be relevant for the court it is an academic discipline's general prestige and the social intellectual role that confers expert authority on its practitioners so um, about, for example um, citations a historian might have credentialed historians thus have a clear path into courts as experts and so famed historians is more easy than uh, perhaps a newer historian, but the road is deceptively smooth, according to the authors. Precisely because they have no trouble gaining admittance in this fashion, historians have neither the need nor really the opportunity to explain to the courts the precise nature of the expertise they bring. This can lead to a situation in which the court's understanding of what historians have to offer and the historian's own notion of their potential contributions are at odds. So just because one has a PhD from, for example, an Ivy League school does not necessarily mean they did their PhD in the correct area. And just being highly cited or highly acclaimed historian doesn't necessarily make one relevant to the case at hand. So what is the nature of historians' expertise as it is understood by the courts and scholars themselves, ask the authors. Many jurists seem to regard knowledge of facts about the past as a primary component of historians' expertise. In this regard, judges share a view of historians and their work that is widespread among the non-academic public. Naturally, according to the authors, courts have access to facts immediately pertinent to the case before them. What they sometimes lack is a broader factual context, either temporal or geographic, and knowledge of more obscure but pertinent past events. As a rule, courts are ready and willing to seek the expertise of historians to fill in such gaps. So they kind of want specialists to be provided that it is with a set of facts about the past curated by experts. They are ready to accord historians entry to the courtroom in order to benefit from this knowledge. Historians have not hesitated to seize the preferred role as experts in the facts of the past. So it also, in some ways, there's an incentive for historians wanting to appear in court because it also it's a validation of their prestige and increases their prestige, for example, if they're on a great or significant Supreme Court case. Many historians' briefs, including the one the author spearheaded in 2014 titled Tuawua, I hope I pronounced that right, see communicating wider historical context uh, to the court as a useful part of the exercise. Their, their brief, for instance, supplemented the factual record of the case by laying out the deeper history of citizenship law in the United States. The historian Amici in Dollar General Corp versus Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians in 2015 similarly informed the courts of the long and relatively little known history of tribal courts with the right to exercise some forms of civil jurisdiction over non-Indians. That's uh, indigenous peoples. In the United States, it's more common to call them Indians. In Canada, it's quite um, generally seen to be improper. Um, but also, for example, some uh, First Nations bands still have the title Indian band. So in that case, it is correct. And, and for example, the Indian Act in Canada is the they should amend the name, but it's it is the technical name. So, my apologies um, for referring to them as Indians. I'm just reading as the as these things are labeled. Therefore, the authors continue. Professional historians, however, see themselves not primarily as repositories of historical facts, but as interpreters of historical events. It is the interpretation of the past, most scholars would argue, that constitutes the real expertise of the historian. If it was just merely facts, one might just look at the, a textbook or, for example, a, a Wikipedia article, but the real value of a historian is, is their interpretive abilities. Such a self-identification implies that historians possess additional types of expertise that they might wish to share with the courts as amici. One is the use of specialized tools or hermeneutic 
or which uh, word meaning concerning interpretation, practices for studying past events. The authors note this includes archival methods as well as ways of reading documents in context and evaluating their meaning and significance. A second area of expertise is a historical narration. Historians' training centers on how to assemble plausitive narratives, a process that involves knowing how to evaluate the relative importance of various causal factors as well as skill applying the discipline's notion about the relationship between causes and effects. It is to these two domains that historians' expertise and their role before the court this chapter will now turn. The authors note some historian Amici have tried to share expertise in historical methods with the courts. As with the factual information, historians have relatively clear route to persuading the court to accept their authority as experts in historical methods. The courts are accustomed to drawing on technical experts and receiving expert opinions. Insofar as historians present themselves as experts in the use of a set of his specific methodological tools that can illuminate the path, at the author's note, they are likely to receive a favorable hearing in the court. So the so the, the betters themselves also are aware of uh, of the need for methodologies and systems in place and the interpretive methods of legal historians or historians more generally the historian friend of the court the author's note benefits here from playing a familiar role similar to that of the special master in a complex or obscure area of law expertise in historical methods has been a main form of assistance proffered in amicus briefs regarding native american history recent law a recent law review article the authors found noted that a large number of indian law cases reaching the u.s supreme court draw on amicus briefs the vast majority of these briefs offered additional support for additional support for merits claims already made by the parties and most fa favor the native side of the litigation and frequently in the form of additional details and interpretation of historical evidence the canadian courts have been particularly willing to draw on historians expert expert testimony and amicus briefs in order to adjudicate cases involving native land claims an important recent case, Sokotan Nation versus British Columbia, which I know many people who worked on that case, in fact, that ultimately decided on an appeal by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2014, offers an illustration of this. So this is actually very close to areas of work that I've been involved in. A crucial part of the trial record was expert testimony by historians concerning the size, depth, and character of the plaintiff's historical claim to land in British Columbia. Much of this testimony rested on the expertise of historians able to make a sense of technically difficult sources such as oral testimony and treaties. So this is a clear value that experts are bringing, had brought to this court, or courts in their appeals as well, up to the Supreme Court of Canada in 2014, which is also the same year that Sam Ehrman and Pearl Rosenthal, Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, were working together as Amici on a different case, however, in the United States. So the authors note, yes, historian Amici may find that claiming methodological expertise provides only a rather narrow doorway to influence over the courts, as the Silcotin Nation case suggests, but much of the potential need for expert historical methodology to elucidate the facts of the case may already have been met in the form of expert testimony submitted to the parties themselves. Insofar as the case record already reflects this expertise, it is not clear what historian Amici are able to add, and if such material has not yet been introduced, the authors note, the judge or parties may object to attempts to smuggle in what should have been trial evidence via appellate briefs instead. So it could be seen as a, a, an alternative avenue going uh, to sort of circumvent the trial evidence process and the parties will lose their usual rights to test such evidence. The court will lose the benefit of such adversarial inquiry, and thus late arriving Amici right to involvement may rest on a weak foundation. So I think it's better to be brought sooner rather than later, rather than come at the very end and completely flip the trial upside down, unless though that is, it can still be proper. Sometimes that is still the correct thing, but it's better late than never, I, I would say. And two other roadblocks, the authors note, one internal to the discipline and the other external to it, that can limit the success of historian Amici in wielding their methodological expertise to influence the courts. 
One problem the authors note is that changes in how history is done over the past 40 years have raised new doubts about the usefulness of historical research in courts. So that's a, an important note. If, if it's changing over time, how can it ever be correct? Linguistic and cultural turns of the 1980s by calling into question whether historians can claim to be describing the past realities in any simple sense can be seen as undermining the claim of historical research to the part of the court's reasoning in a in a broader sense, scholarship influenced by the new cultural history rests in part on a willingness to use evidence that more anecdotal, exceptional, or incomplete than might have been deemed acceptable. The authors note this has allowed the scholars to open up new doors and to see many more actors than earlier scholarship did. Yet, it comes as a cost, the authors note, for non-specialists, the truth status of claims based on this sort of evidence may be may seem far less secure than that which is based on more traditional historical evidence. The second kind of trouble, which is the external, can arise when historians claim their specialized methods enable them to arrive at a most accurate account of the past legal question. Amicus brief submitted by a group of historians in Patterson v. McLean Credit Union by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1989 illustrates this problem, so the authors note. Historian Amici in this case claimed that a review of new scholarship showed that the 1866 statute St uh, statute at the heart of the case, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, reached private discrimination. Yet historians' efforts to make their claims about the past status of legal questions, as they did in Patterson, can quickly run up against the court's well-developed sense of their own expertise and authority concerning the interpretations of the law in the past. Common law courts, which derive their authority and the law they apply from the past, understand the elucidation of precedent to be part of their expertise. So it's not necessarily the place of a historian to come in and sort of analyze the precedent, because that is the place of the judge. When historian Amici try to elucidate past from them, they may be asking the court to humble itself just a bit too much for comfort. Another kind of know-how historians may offer the court, the author's note in expertise in historical narration, are the ways of describing historical causation and reconstructing how past events unfolded. In many cases, the fundamental premise of the historian's narrative or its notion of narrative art is its notion that there is a significant disjuncture between past and present, and the historian's task is to explain how change occurs. It's a chain of causation, the authors note, that explains change over time. As historians understand it, it's invariable, invariably multiple in nature. Understanding it thus involves, according to the authors, detecting and integrating multiple causes into a plausible account of how past events occurred. Doing so requires both observing and noting the complexity of the past and determining which causes were major and which ones were minor in particular historical moment. So they cannot be too granularly focused, I think that's uh, quite clear. But they, but they cannot neglect the grains as well. Historical narratives, the author's note, can provide backstories for legal rules and categories of examination and or examine how such legal items that have themselves changed across time. An example, the author's site first approach is historian's amicus brief in the District of Columbia versus Heller in 2008, with a dispute over me the meaning of the Second Amendment right to bear arms. The brief presented a ca causally attuned narrative history of that guarantee and its antecedents, and during colonial, revolutionary, and founding eras, concerns animating each such provision were not an individual right to self-defense, but rather the ability of one government institution to use control of an armed militia as a check against aggrandizement of a, by a competing governmental in institution. Hence, historians concluded authors of the Second Amendment would be flabbergasted to learn that their work was also precluding restrictions on such potentially dangerous property as firearms. Historian Amici took the second approach in Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015, the author's site, which involved a potential constitutional right to same-sex marriage. Describing instances of historical changeability of marriage, they declared that recognizing the rights of individuals to the same sex to marry was consistent with the historical trend. So by showing a historical trend, one can 
supposedly extrapolate into the future, according to the historians. Though such displays of expertise in historical narration comport well in the historian's sense of what they do, they face a triple challenge of Biden being accepted by the court courts that authors note. For one, historians may find themselves asked to justify the status of this form of expertise as expertise in the first place because it is not generally regarded by lay people as a typical to, of historians' knowledge. So, as historians are generally supposed to be thought as uh, looking at the past, not extrapolating into the future, and historians themselves must bear some responsibility for this confusion. The profession's commitment to speaking to a general audience is, has often led historians to bury or conceal methodological discussions that other disciplines, especially those in the silent social sciences, are at pains to make explicit. So sometimes to, to make it, uh, historians do, I think, reach a broader audience than even lawyers, for example. I think pretty much ev everyone has some interest in history, but some people have zero interest in law, I think. But, um, or it's, at least it's more generally applicable, but therefore the authors have to sort of package it to a slightly more broader audience. While every historian waits, um, causes, and considers how to narrate, the norm of the large swaths of this discipline has been to do this silently rather than overtly, even in scholarly monographs. The second and more serious challenge for historians as narrators arises when the subject of narration skirts close to legal interpretation. When it comes to the meaning of past legal pronouncements, judges jealously guard their own competing methods of historical narration. Common law courts are essentially historical institutions, as we've alluded to and the authors note. The law they interpret and indeed their authority as an institution are both rooted in continuity in the past. Thus, jurists have resisted notions of radical disjunctures between past and present, which would cut the common law courts off from their source of legitimacy. They have insisted, instead, pardon me, offered their own narration of the law's history, built on the assumption of a broad gauge continuity. This has not prevented courts from imagining change over time, but it does mean that historical narratives can be integrated into the judge's interpretation of the past and may face less resistance than those that mount a frontal assault. So, sort of, the strategy for Amici is to sort of try to um, facilitate or align themselves with the, the, the judges or the, the legists rather than try to go head to head and try to completely override their methodology and uh, absolutely not to have an absolute break from the past. The recent rise, but which I think would be unnatural for the historians in the first place, but nonetheless possible. The recent rise of originalism in American law, the authors note, presents a third and related challenge. Like Amica's briefs by historians, originalism has a political history at risk of oversimplification. It has proceeded through three post-war incarnations, the proto-originalism of Justice Hugo Black's textualism and the rebriefing of in Brown versus Board of Education in 1854, the original intent of jurisprudence, originalism 1.0, they call it, that was attacked by the Warren's court decisions and the original public meaning of jurisprudence, originalism 2.0, and that is the focus of the current efforts to deconstruct the New Deal state. In spite of the significant differences among these three periods, originalists of all stripes are committed to the notion that the law has a fixed meaning that should remain the same invariant through time. To the extent that courts take up such interpretive approaches, the space for historical narratives of the changing meaning of legal dictates will shrink to the vanishing point. So there's kind of a common um, uh, uh, theme within law is it, is it is there a continuity or is it changing over time? Is there some constant absolute truth to certain laws or do laws necessarily change over time? If the former, then there's less of a place or a shrinking place for the historian Amici. Moving to section four titled Historians Amicus Briefs, circa 1950s to 2015. So getting up to uh, the, close to the present. It is 2023 at the time of this recording. A survey of the key Supreme Court cases involving historians' amicus briefs over the past century, according to the authors, reveals the crucial role that ideas about the relative expertise of jurists and their historian friends have had on scholars' success or not. In speaking to the courts, the institution of amicus briefs is a relatively late-blooming phenomenon in American law. 
as previously mentioned, and during the 19th century and first decades of the 20th century, amicus briefs were rare. In the years after World War II, the number of amicus briefs filled, uh, filed pardon me, in the federal courts grew larger, and the number have expanded substantially over 70 years since. Yet even as amicus briefs have become more common, historians were laggards. Recent courts suggest that as late as the 1990s, fewer than one historian amicus brief was filed per year before the Supreme Court. Historians' amicus briefs have proliferated in the decade, according to the author, and, ha and a half since 2001, and between 2006 and 2012, <coughs> pardon me, historians presented over 30 to the Supreme Court alone. So there's a, definitely an increasing usage of am historian amicus briefs within the courtroom setting. One of the earliest uses of historians' expertise in the Supreme Court came from Brown v. Board of Education, as previously noted in 1954. Though no brief by independent historians, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, drew on a group of historians to write the historical portions of their arguments on the plaintiff's behalf in opposition to segregation. The authors note this spurred the court's question about the relationship on the reconstruction of amendments to segregation, and they were to historians in the hopes, and or pardon me, they went to historians in hopes of finding evidence that the two had been at odds. They were unable to cite strong evidence that the framers of the reconstruction amendments had in fact intended to bar racial segregation, and the historians instead offered studied ambiguity. Their arguments came down to the claim that the history of Reconstruction was complex enough that the court could not reasonably draw firm conclusions from it either way. So sort of one of the earlier significant involvements of amicus briefs, historians' amicus briefs. In spite of the historians' best efforts, though, it might not be unfair to characterize their intervention in Brown as a failure. The authors note, perhaps influenced by the historian's agnosticism about the lessons of the past, the court turned to the social science, psychology, not history, to resolve the case. Thus, the historians who participated in the case did not exert a strong influence on its outcome, at least in a positive sense. The failure of the historians in this case had effects that went well beyond the mis beyond missing an opportunity for influence. The social scientific basis on which the court ultimately decided Brown had long been a source of concern to some and have insisted that the constitutional principles should rest on more enduring and abstract grounds. A decision based on historical record, for instance, the authors note, one that unmasked the intentions of Jim Crow's framers to reestablish the racial caste throughout the former Confederacy, might have set the whole edifice of racial justice on a firmer footing in the later 20th century. So perhaps it's lamentable that the historians' amicus briefs were not overly influential in the Brown vs. Board of Education in 1954. The experience in Brown, the author's note, suggests some of the lasting difficulties that arose as historians have intervened as amici. One was historians' relative lack of prestige, especially by comparison to the chain of historical causation that explains change over time, as historians understand it, is invariably multiple in nation, nature. The, the understanding it thus involves detecting the integrating multiple causes into a plausible account of how the past events occurred, and doing so requires both observing and noting the complexity of the past and determining which causes were major and which were minor in a particular historical mo moment. And there's also, so, as noted, this relative lack of prestige, especially in comparison to the social scientists. So why is this the author's note? And this can be linked, the author's note, to the relative prestige attached to their methods, especially at the height of the post-war science boom. The psychological research on which Brown Court drew in deciding the case presented itself not only as expert, but as decisive as well. As became clear in the years after Brown, historians were not always comfortable becoming advocates. A number of historians involved in Brown, both at the time and later on, the author's note expressed concern that performing advocacy had caused them to distort their historical work. They worried that, spurred by their desire to reach a particular outcome, they had drawn conclusions that were not warranted by strict historical methods. In effect, the historians came to doubt their ability to maintain their expertise in the con context of the courtroom. <coughs> 
This form of methodological self-doubt would be a persistent issue, according to the authors, among historians writing Amicus briefs and may have played a role in undermining the breadth, scope, and success of their arguments of time. So there's this kind of external fact that some people, for some reason or another, they found the historians less prestigious as for some of the other social sciences, such as psychology, but also they have their own sort of self-doubt, sort of an internal fact of pushing it. And because they don't want to be uh, necessarily advocates of, um, they want to be for sort of more neutral, perhaps, or, and, but nonetheless, there's, there's, there's internal causes as well. Historians, again, the author's note, saw an opportunity to intervene productively in the Supreme Court's work in two high-profile cases in the 1980s, Webster versus Reproductive Health Services in 1989, and Patterson versus McLean Credit Union in 1989. Historian Amici, in each case, sought to make an argument about how documents that drew legitimacy from history ought to be interpreted. Timing of the high profile briefs re reflected the broader trends in the academy and at the court in the 1980s and had seen originalism explode onto the scene as a method of constitutional interpretation, as courts seemed increasingly open to historical grounded argumentations. Some historians had grown accustomed to addressing the relationship between history and law. Relatedly, legal history was emerging as a major subfield distinct from originalism and often housed in law schools. The Webster case, the authors note, addressed the state rules restricting the use of state funds for abortion-related activities. The Supreme Court had previously rooted such fundamental rights in their limits in the history of the traditions of the United States. More than 200 historians co-signed a amicus brief presenting the court with a family of historical narratives intended to favor abortion rights. Some supported a tradition of permitting abortion, others undermined the argument that there was any tradition to the contrary, as the government argued. The Michi, the authors note, here deployed a range of forms of historical expertise. Justices learned novel historical facts and context, including religious authorities prior to and prior reluctance to campaign against abortion. The, br the brief walked them through the historical methods of analysis as the conclusion that the unenforced anti-abortion laws revealed widespread lack of moral concern with the issue. It also reviewed op the opponent's claim of a long-standing United States concern with a fetal life by representing a historical narrative in which factors such as sexism, racism, and professional chauvinism had driven much more of the ebb and flow of abortion restrictions. So once again, I'll, even, I would say even a larger influence of the historian's Amici briefs in this Webster case. The briefers in Webster, the authors note, self-consciously understood themselves as engaging in advocacy as well as history, something that previously they um, supposedly hoped to avoid. Yet some participants still came to worry the brief had become be had been better lawyering than historical scholarship. Several participants writing later in the public historian attempted to redefine their claim to expertise by arguing that their role as Amici was to be an expert advocates. They aimed to make only true, historically defensible claims, that, but they focused the attention selectively, the authors note, with the goal of influencing the outcome. So, to what extent should, should they remain um, non, uh, in a non-advocate role? According to a central, central participant in the brief, the historian James C. Moore, that, J that Janus, face, the uh, two-faced god, role did not need to be expressly mentioned in the brief because that was what it was to be an amicus. So therefore, it's supposed to be sort of two-sided and sort of argue on both sides, or at least acknowledge both sides. The participants' doubts about the status of their expertise when they were acting as advocates spread too. As Jane E. Larson and Clyde Spillinger recalled of their experiences as attorneys, the authors found on their brief, some signatories worried that the unqualified nature of the briefs, arguments, and assertions jeopardized their claim to historical expertise. The authors further note that just as serious as George Will argued, to the extent that, that policy preference drove the historian's conclusion, the historian could be seen as intruding on the judge's domain. So if the, the historians are driven by 
some policy aims, then it's almost like a different branch get um, influencing the judicial branch, which is supposed to be separate, as per Montesquieu, who later influenced the, the Federalist Papers, which influenced the Constitution itself. The experience of the Amici in the Patterson case reveals more vividly the author's note the still tenuous position of historians expertise when it comes under suspicion of being shaped by advocacy. The case asked whether a protection against race discrimination in the Enforcement Act of 1866 as amended covered discrimination by private individuals or only discrimination attributable to public officials. The court had previously signaled the meaning of the act at the time of its passage would determine its meaning today, as the author of the definitive monograph on Re Reconstruction, Eric Fawner, the author's note, filed an amicus brief with several other historians. It observed the sharp line of the court had come to draw between private and public acts was relatively recent vintage. The framers of the Enforcement Act did not think in, ter in those terms. With that proviso made, the brief advanced one inescapable conclusion the framers of the act intended to prohibit certain forms of private activity. Though framed in absolute language, the authors note it was a modest claim. At the time when lawmakers did not sharply divide the public and private in today's terms, they passed a law that covered at least some material in both domains. The seeming modesty of the patterson Amici argument that the authors note, though, could not protect it from suspicion that the authors had crafted a, an historical narrative to support the preferred disposition of the case. More than one observer noticed that the brief was selective in its narration of the Civil Rights Bill of 1866. Fawner in Reese Construction, America's Unfinished Revolution, a book, himself had argued the bill was, this is a quote, primarily directed against the public, not private acts of injustice. Even before the court issued its opinion, the Harvard Law professor Randall Kennedy had noted the so again, quote, shared contrast between the ambivalent, nuanced, and tentative treatment of the issue. In his book, The Unambiguous Assertions of the Brief, later became known that, the justice, that Justice Anthony Kennedy had told his colleagues he found a gap between Foner's treatment of the issue in his monography and the brief to be highly misleading. Together, the authors note Patterson case and the Webster case amicus briefs became a cautionary tale about the perils of, for historians seeking to divide labor with judges. To leave all judgment to the judges would be to author a brief that helped no one. Authors of Webster brief, brief forthrightly acknowledged as much. But if one lets the policy preferences guide one's scholarly work, as some suspected the Amici had done in these cases, their claim to expertise became shakier, shakier and the line between the expertise of that and that of the judges less sharp. So sort of keep out the um, political influences, I would say, um, became less sharp to their detriment. Conversely, the authors note, as Patterson suggests, to intrude de too deeply into the realm of judgment is to invite judicial backlash. At some undefined point in the process, historical expertise must give way to judicial expertise. So at the end, the, the, the judges have the final say. This must be true. In Patterson, Justice Kennedy reacted to what he understood to be Fawner's attempt to shade the history to his preferred policy outcome. So, uh, sort of a, a hidden agenda. What was less clear from these cases, however, was how historians could find a way to achieve respectful relevance within the bounds of what they understood to be expertise, their, their expertise. The authors further note, historians seem to find firmer footing when they submitted briefs in the early 21st century cases involving same-sex relationships. Historian Nancy Cott was at the center of the effort, which, which spanned more than a decade. The success of the amicus briefers in those cases, the authors point out, can be attributed to several factors. They began to lay the groundwork for briefs very early. They identified and leveraged the authority of areas of historical consensus. Individuals who span the legal historical divide joined the effort, and their briefs aimed to facilitate rather than oppose the doctrinal changes that the court seemed inclined to make. And perhaps most fortuitously, the authors point out, their opponents' arguments rested on highly dubious historical foundations. The path to marriage equality, the authors point out, 
Amicus Briefs was unusually long. In 2000, Cop published her groundbreaking History of, the Amer of American Marriage titled Public Vows, a book, as the title suggested, argued marriage was first and foremost a public institution, not, as people often conceived it, a natural, private, and eternal. And or eternal, I would say. Cot also reminded her readers of marriage's long history as an instrument of coercion and oppression. Two years later, the authors found Cot joined an amicus brief in Lawrence v. Texas in 2003, and authored by a handful of historians' work focused on sexual orientation. The issue of the case was whether to overturn the holding in Bowers v. Harbrook, a case of 18, 1986, pardon me, that the Constitution permitted states to criminalize same-sex sodomy. The Bowers decision rested on assertion that such bans had ancient roots and an, implicit, and an implicit acknowledgement of the difficulty identifying secular justification for the practice that legal thinkers had long treated as a victimless crime. So they, hard, they, they were hard pressed to find a non or to find a secular justification for why it should be not permitted. The Lawrence brief contested that claim, arguing that signaling out same sex sexual conduct for particular operation was 20th century innovation that had begun to decline even before the century had ended. In overturning Bowers, the Lawrence court cribbed repeatedly from the historian's brief. The authors note a dozen years later, Cott co-authored the amicus brief in Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015. The signatories, a select group of historians of marriage, family, and law, included scholars who were experts in the languages of both historians and judges. The case presented the question whether the Constitution had included a right to same-sex marriage, and they were unable to muster social science evidence that associated same-sex marriage with measurable harms. The opponents sought the refuge in history. They argued marriage was an unchanging institution eternally focused on promoting procreation. The historian's brief answered by discussing the many public purposes marriage had served and many public forms it had taken. The court's opinion declaring the right to same-sex marriage cited public vows repeatedly. Cott's two interventions, the authors point out, were undoubted successes. Perhaps among the most successful interventions by historians Amici in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence. Yet the authors find it may prove difficult for other scholars to repeat success, the success of those briefs. Cott may have ridden the unicorn, they point out. Rare indeed are cases where opponents can identify no convincing secular reason to in favor of their argument. Few are the scholars who can write a book that so clearly foreshadows a major constitutional litigation campaign. So perhaps Cott had a sort of gift of, for, um, of foresight. Yet there are some elements, the authors point out, of those briefs that are replicable. replicable replicable, pardon me, the ability to identify and convey historical consensus, to find scholars who can speak history to courts, and to write with an ear to the court to that which the court is prepared to hear. Kristen Collins replicated elements of the above strategy during the second decade of the 21st century in cases concerning sex discrimination and inter intergenerational transmission of citizenship such as in the Flores Filler versus the United States case in 2011, featured, the author's note, a challenge to the federal statute making it easier for unmarried U.S. citizen women to transmit citizenship to children whose parent was an alien than for unmarried U.S. citizen men to do the same. Colin Spear headed a brief presenting the substantial historical scholarship on the role of gender stereotypes in sex-differentiated citizenship law. After Justice Elena Kagan's refusal caused the court to divide evenly in 2011, the issue returned to the court in the Session versus Morales-Santana case in 2017. In the interim, the authors point out Collins returned to the archive, then published an influential legal historical article in the Yale Law Journal that became the basis for the revised brief she and her colleagues offered the court in Morales-Santana. 
The article revealed the facial sex discrimination of citizenship laws often serve racist and nativist policy aims. The authors also note uh, that also demonstrated that racial chauvinism and gender stereotypes were animating concerns for the framers of the specific laws at issue before the justices. When the court struck down such laws as Morales Santana, Collins' analysis was central to its reasoning. A very different but no less successful model of historical intervention in the court's jurisprudence arose in the period between Lawrence and Obergefell, with the, with the litigant with the litigation of detainees of Guantanamo Bay. The authors point out that despite the myriad of doctrinal tangles that these ca those cases raise, they all unfolded against the same basic backdrop, the doctrine of the separation of powers. Specifically, the authors point out, the cases raise the question of aggrandizement. What was the executive claiming unprecedented powers? Were the political branches seeking to subjugate the judiciary? Or was the judiciary on the brink of transforming itself into a political actor itself? In amicus briefs filed in a series of detention cases, historians argued that legitimate questions of executive overreach were at issue and sought to reassure the court that the steps in it was being asked to take were not unprecedented. One brief authored by scholars of Ex Parte Quirin in 1942, a Supreme Court case granting the executive board discretion over prisoners during wartime, argued that Quirin had been riddled by bias, conflicts of interest, undue executive influence, judicial haste, and lack of authority, the authors note. To rest upon it, again, would be to legitimize the executive power's power grab over the court's prior abdication of authority. So this is certainly not what we want in the spirit of the separation of powers. And another brief contended that that that, th that they thought the early republic faced undeclared wars, difficulties of identification, and irregular conflict it had to adhere to normal law. The implication was that the executive was now seeking powers that its predecessor in similar circumstances had done without. Other historian Amici reassured the justices that the judges had long been called upon to review detentions in similar circumstances. There was nothing unusual about taking on such a role in the instant cases. The authors continue that the court was broadly receptive to the arguments of the Amici. It rejected the military tribunals that the executive unilaterally sought to establish and affirmed its ability to review the constitutionality of the prisoner's detention. What did these scholars do right, the authors ask? One part of the answer is that the historian Amici in these cases offered up one of the most more modest forms of expertise they had to provide, the small gift of historical context. In these cases, they could be effective simply by offering the court an account of its own jurisprudence and the executive branch's actions over previous 100 plus, 200 plus years. That was sufficient to give the justices the confidence in their intervention would be more preservative than disruptive to the separation of powers status quo, the authors point out. And further, they note, in this sense, the historian Amici were lucky too. The nature of the case meant that they could influence the outcome without needing, like the Amici in Patterson, the Patterson case, to claim that they could elucidate the past state of legal principles, as with the briefs in Obergefell and Lawrence. Furthermore, the Amici in the detainee cases were at pains to enlist select groups of specialists, including historians situated at the law schools. This strategy enabled them to maximize their chances of speaking with authoritative historical voice that would still be comprehensible to the justices. So moving to the last section we have here, section five, titled, Whether the Historian's Amicus Brief? Question mark. So the authors point out that though the primary goal of this chapter has been to reflect on the practice of amicus briefing by historians, the author's analysis suggests a few ways in which historians can make best use of their expertise before the courts. These thoughts are offered by way of conclusion in the full knowledge that they are necessarily preliminary in nature. So the authors first note that the historian who acts as a Michi of the courts aims to influence the law's development by participating in a judicial institution outside 
as an outside expert. Such a stance carries ethical obligations. The court permits the historian's participation in cases on the presumption that the historian has expertise of the court's values and the historian aims to assist the court in doing its duty. Fulfilling this role will often require historians to speak a language legible to courts on matters of concern to them. While respecting the court's distinct areas of authority, threading these various needles as our analytic and historical overviews of historians' briefs suggest, it is, the author's note, not easy. One set of strategies that historians would do well to adopt, the authors point out in writing amicus briefs, is to focus on respecting the disciplinary divide between historians and judges. Historians will do well to stop short of purporting to decide legal questions. Further, the authors note judges often understand their roles to include, at a minimum, the final disposition of the case. That makes sense, the authors point out, for if an historical account wholly decides a dispute, the division of labor between judge and historian has ceased to exist. Seeking to find a line between what history can say and what the ultimate issue in the case can also be an effective way to discipline scholars' tendency to let policy preferences cloud out better judgment and impair our claims to expertise. Further, the authors continue respecting the disciplinary divide is not only a matter of content, it is also a matter of personnel. Limiting participation in amicus briefs, the authors point out to experts on a specific topic at issue, has proved to be beneficial in gaining the attention of judges. Busy judges besieged by filings may view a brief with hundreds of signatories more as a citizen lobby than an expert's submission. That is, I think, makes sense, for example. 300 people sign the petition, well, you can't have 300 experts, so at one point it must be considered citizen lobbying, even if a good portion are experts, then maybe it still could be validated, but at some point if too many people are signing it, for example, it starts to become citizen lobbying. Therefore, the authors note, curating participation is also a way to increase the likelihood that participants critically read and fully stand behind the submission of the court. So further, a uh, benefit there. Another set of strategies, the authors point out, conversely calls for attempts to bridge that disciplinary divide. So on one hand, separate it, but on the other hand, bridge it. So here, the intermediaries are often key. Lawyers familiar with history, and historians of both law and history, legal historians who understand law well, or historians willing to learn about law, all contribute to briefs that judges may understand and use. And I think anyone who's watched any of these uh, or read any of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History evidently has some interest in both law and history, which is what they're looking for here. They continue, the authors, a historian can also increase the likelihood that a judge will find her brief helpful by providing the judge with multiple points of entry into the argument. Some of the successful briefs we have discussed above argue, or previously, both that history runs contrary to the claim some other party or amicus is making, and that there are good reasons to think that history supports the result for which the amicus advocates. Another approach is to use and then to provide her, their analysis of the relative historical valid, validity of one or another approach. By the same token, the authors note, historian Amici should do more in their briefs to set out explicitly for the courts of methodological assumptions underlying their arguments, and historian Amicus might work out in detail for the court why they believe a particular event occurred or why a text was intended in a particular way. By making their methods explicit, the authors further point out, they can work to re revalorize them as expertise. That is doubly important when one considers that the court frequently musters historical narratives as support for their legal reasoning. Courts are experts in understanding what sorts of historical narratives potentially have this legitimate function, legitimizing function, pardon me, but they are less expert in understanding which of those narratives will withstand historians' scrutiny. Historians can thus provide courts information on their historical credibility of various potentially attractive historical narratives. So that's one way of a historian. Maybe the historian isn't necessarily expert in all the areas, or perhaps in each of the areas, but if they can say, hmm, perhaps this history is superior to that history, that is something that is value that the judge won't necessarily be able to bring. 
Finally, the authors point out it is worth bearing in mind that Amicus briefing is not just one a one-way street in which historians aim to serve the court and get nothing in return. The authors point out participating in judicial proceedings as Amici can also lead to new research questions and to sharper formulations of old ones. Like Collins' contribution to the Yale Law Journal, one example of many, the authors point out, the concerns that drive historians to write amicus briefs are continuous with the ones that lead to innovative historical research. The discipline that legal process imposes may even serve to stimulate new thinking. The author's own experience attests to the potential scholarly benefits to be reaped from participating in judicial processes. Their brief in Tuawua, though it did not succeed in persuading the court, did get them wondering about the surprising fact that there seemed to be uniform, though racially discriminatory, jus soli, or justice alone, previously mentioned in Latin, citizenship rule for the first century of the Republic. The authors have since embarked on what promises to be a long-term research project of the history of just solely concept, which is focused on how it came into being in the 19th century and the legal conflicts and complexities that it sought to obscure. The authors hope, then, for themselves and for others as well, becoming friends of the court can lead beyond the win-lose proposition of a case's disposition, disposition and into the richer realms of new scholarly sleuthing. So, also, it's got two-way street. The historians, by going to the court, can learn not only more about their own research, but also learn more about the law. So, uh, thank you very much to these two great authors for a very fascinating chapter. We'll talk about the content of the slide here, and then go into a comparison between the two, and then have a brief impromptu conclusion. So once again, this section is in section 5, Illustrations, Doing Things with Legal History. It is chapter 57, the last chapter of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, titled Historians, Amicus Briefs, Practice and Prospect, by Sam Ehrman and Nathan Pearl Rosenthal. So starting on the left side with Sam Ehrman's content, he is a professor of law, and that's his position, at the institution, University of Michigan Law School. In terms of the two images for him, we have in the bottom right, Harvard University, where he received his Bachelor of Arts, or his AP, as they call it in Harvard, and in the bottom left, we have the University of Michigan, where he received his Juris Doctor and his PhD. Moving to the other side, on the right side, we have Nathan Pearl Rosenthal. He is Physician Associate Professor of History, Spatial Sciences, and Law at the institution, University of Southern California, USC, Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. In the bottom right, we have Harvard University, where he received his AB, or his Bachelor of Arts. In the bottom middle, we have Columbia University, where he received his PhD. And in the bottom left, we have the University of Southern California, where he is currently a, an associate professor. Might also be noted that uh, Sam Ehrman, as well, did teach for a time at the University of Southern California, as well. So, in terms of suggested readings, we have er, for, er, by Ehrman S., um, Almost Citizens, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Constitution and Empire, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2018, and by Pearl Rosenthal N., The Age of Revolutions and the Generations Who Made It, uh, published by Basic, Basic Books, and it's forthcoming so it's late, to come out in 2024. In terms of the research interests for Nate Sam Ehrman, it's constitutional law and legal history, and for Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, it's political and cultural history of Europe and the Americas in the age of revolution with particular attention to transnational influences that shaped modern national politics. In terms of the two quotes that I was able to fit on the slide, first quote, the institution of amicus curiae, or friends of the court brief, is at once an admission of humility by the court and a gauntlet thrown down by it. It is a statement of humility because it represents judges' acknowledgement that their knowledge of a case, whether of the relevant doctrines or of the factual context, may be imperfect. But it is also a gauntlet that they throw down. The Amici are challenged to prove to the court that they have knowledge or authority that the court ought to respect. Second and last quote. The authors hope then for themselves and for others as well, becoming friends of the court can lead beyond the win-lose proposition of a case's disposition and into the richer realms of new scholarly sleuthing. So, thank you very much to Sam Ehrman and Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, so in the style of Plutarch's Lives, to maybe learn a little bit more about these two uh, scholars 
and authors, we will do a brief comparison. So Sam Ehrman, he is a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School, whereas Nathan Pearl Rosenthal is an associate professor of history, spatial sciences, and law at USC Dornsite College of Letters. So while uh, so one is a full professor, the other is an associate professor. One is a professor specifically in, in a law professor in a law school, whereas Nathan Pearl Rosenthal is not a, a specifically law professor, although he does have legal research. He's actually in the USC Dornsite College of Letters. Uh, co College of Letters. Uh, full title, College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences, pardon me. In, ter uh, in terms of their education, they both did their bachelor's uh, degree, their AB from Harvard University, um, for, but Sam Ehrman graduated in 2000, Nathan Pearl Rosenthal graduated in 2004, so we may guess Sam Ehrman is a little bit older, unless uh, one or the other took some time off, which might increase or decrease the age difference. Sam Ehrman received his Juris Doctor Summa Cum Laude and first in his class at the Michigan and was Michigan Law Review Editor-in-Chief in 2007, whereas Nathan Pearl Rosenthal did not go to law school. However, he received his PhD from Columbia University in 2011, whereas Sam Ehrman received his PhD from the University of Michigan in American Culture in 2010. So, um, Sam Ehrman received his PhD one year earlier than Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, but he also started four years, or graduated from his undergraduate degree four years earlier, but he also squeezed in a Juris Doctor as well, where he was actually the top in his class in one of the top 14 law schools in the United States, according to the most uh, recently published universe, uh, U.S. News and World Report uh, law school rankings. Um, Sam Ehrman did clerk for the U.S. Court of Appeals D.C. Circuit for the Honorable Merrick Garland in the Supreme Court of the United States, Justice Anthony Kennedy and John Paul Stevens. Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, because he did not go to law school, he was not able to clerk, but nonetheless, even amongst uh, people who have gone to law schools to clerk at, uh, not only a district court, but the Supreme Court of the United States is a very uh, high achievement, and he was the first in his class as well. They have both worked together as friends of the court, or as Amici, in fact, even in the same um, same cases as well. For example, the multi-million dollar piracy prosecution in the 19th of the 1780s Mauritius and examination of the sudden emergence of just solely just sanguinous binary binary in modern nationality law. So that's a area where they worked together, probably met each other, maybe I don't know where they first met each other, I wasn't able to determine, but maybe they met each other when they were both at Harvard because or maybe they never even overlapped if, if uh, Sam Irwin graduated four years later, but maybe they both met each other at University of Southern Cal uh, California, USC. Or they definitely know each other now. If not, they first met each other during those cases and in their further research on just solely. The Sam Irwin has one book, as far as I can find, and 11 articles and, or notes, or, or maybe more, whereas Nathan Pearl Rosenthal does have... Uh, two books and as well a third forthcoming so actually perhaps more books and many essays and reviews so perhaps Nathan Pearl Rosenthal currently has more books I'm not sure the number of pages I'm not sure how many perhaps uh, Sam Ehrman has more articles and notes that add up to accumulate to more than um, the number of books that Nathan Pearl Rosenthal has but nonetheless as far as I can find Nathan Pearl Rosenthal does have a, a few more books perhaps or a couple more books they both clearly have a fascination in legal history, and but they're both, unlike many of the other scholars in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, they both have a, a, a specific focus on the United States of America, which is not necessarily true for the other scholars. So th thank you very much for watching this last video on Guide to Legal History and Historians. It has been quite a ride. This is the longest series that I've produced so far, and thank you for anyone who's managed to even go through uh, any individual video, I know these are quite long, I think, or at least, at least over tw 27 hours, I think, I'm close, I don't know, probably around 35 hours of just lecture time. It takes me, I guess, for some background information, I have, it, uh, it takes me, about, it took me about a week to read through each chapter, and then I would have about a day preparing the PowerPoint deck, and an additional time for the, for the comparisons, so, Took a, this took a lot of time, a lot of time behind the behind the scenes as well, so it wasn't just the 35 hours of direct um, uh, lecturing, but nonetheless it's been quite quite the ride. I think I had two black eyes, 
during that period and lots of things, a couple, couple haircuts and such, but it's been quite a ride and I, I'm incredibly grateful to Marcus Dubber, Christopher Tomlins, and all the authors of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. Marcus Dubber did note to me that I, I could use this content for this production, but he, I'm not, I've not been endorsed by the um, editors or any of the authors, so I'd like to note that as well. And I hope you learned um, even perhaps even one thing from it, from this I'd be great um, um, I'd be content with the output I know on my end I have learned an, uh, an infinite more than I even imagined I could and probably um, just every day I think about some part, one of the chapters or one of the one of the authors or one of the comparisons pops up in my head so as I'll be going off to law school and uh, you know one of the well, actually the oldest law school in Canada I'll be looking forward to bringing this this education and background and yeah, thank you so much for your support and I hope you continue to support and if you like or subscribe or comment, I'd be very grateful for that too. So thank you so much and I hope all the best for you.